Today, we're fortunate enough to have three guest speakers. First, we have Christine Watson, who has served as a research coordinator at the Elkhorn Slough National Estuary and Research Reserve for 20 years. She's passionate about restoration of native oysters and salt marshes and conducts experiments to inform restoration strategies. In addition to her local place-based work at Elkhorn Slough, Kirstein has led major collaborative projects across the network of the National Estuarian Research Reserves. And then we have Beth Watson, who is an environmental science faculty member at Drexel University in Philadelphia, where she teaches classes on climate change, restoration, wetlands, biochemistry, and ecology, and conducts research focused on coastal ecosystem change. Beth has contributed to over 50 peer-reviewed publications on various topics related to human impacts to coastal wetlands, sediment transport, and water quality, and works closely with stakeholders to ensure that her research promotes informed conservation, informed coastal management. And then finally, we have Kenny Raposa, who's a research coordinator at the Nargassan Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve in Rhode Island, and he served there for over 19 years. Trained as a salt marsh ecologist, he's, his research now focused on examining salt, uh, marsh resilience to climate change and sea level rise and evaluating different adaptations to adaptive strategies aimed at building resilience. Kenny is currently involved in multiple large-scale thin-layer sediment placement projects in southern Rhode Island and is co-lead for the National Estuary and Research Reserve field experiment evaluating TLP in replicate experimental field plots. So today our presenters are going to present their talk entitled Building Marsh Capital, Adding Sediment to Help Marsh Face Rising Seas. All right, so thank you for that great introduction, Eric, to our three presenters today. I want to be very clear that there are far more than three people that were behind the project that we're going to spend the next 40 minutes telling you about. We had a fantastic team from eight different National Estuary Research Reserves and some highly involved partners from other organizations. And we had the support of a really diverse advisory committee of coastal managers and scientists from state and federal organizations and NGOs from around the country who were involved in every step of what you're going to hear about today. Our primary funding was from the Neuroscience Collaborative, but all of the participating reserves and other partners also contributed support. So our talk today has three parts. We're going to start with an overview of TLP and some guidance documents we prepared, move on to greenhouse experiments relevant to TLP, and then finish with our coordinated TLP field experiment. So uh, backing way up, the, the goal for all of this work is to conserve and restore tidal marshes because they're valuable, they have a lot of ecosystem services. We've lost a lot already due to diking and draining and other human impacts, but looking to the future, they're very at risk from accelerated sea level rise. Raising their elevation through sediment addition is one climate adaptation strategy. So if we look at this in a sort of conceptual diagram, um, you picture a healthy salt marsh has the low marsh dominant, above that some other rarer high marsh species. If there's rapid sea level rise, then that low marsh can drown and you have open mud pans and the high marsh community gets squeezed out as the low marsh migrates upward. The concept between sediment addition is that you could add as much sediment as the water level increase and have low marsh colonize those bare areas again and high marsh return to the area it formerly occupied so you've come back to your starting point. And here's a photo tour, a real life <laughs> example of that from Minigrit Marsh in Rhode Island where you had a very flooded marsh area, added a lot of sediment. Initially it's bare, but then it became colonized by a higher marsh community. <laughs> 
So our team, the advisory committee, the NER team, the partners, prepared this packet of guidance resources that we hope is useful to many of you on the webinar today. And here's a little screenshot of the cover and the link to where it is, and Eric will send that out to in the chat box at the end of today's webinar. This guidance packet has four components, and I want to just introduce you very briefly to each one. So the first component is a consensus statement with 25 signatories that include our NER partners and that advisory committee, really diverse membership. And the consensus statement summarizes the state of knowledge about TLP and makes recommendations. There are 11 different points in it, and I just want to briefly run you through each one. So first of all, Increasing salt marsh resilience in the face of sea level rise will require implementation of climate adaptation strategies. Whether you're looking at my marsh at Elkhorn or Kenny's marsh in Narragansett, these marshes will not be able to maintain their current footprint without active management. And one emerging climate adaptation strategy is PLP which generally involves 10 to 50 centimeters of sediment addition to increase elevation, though it could be less or it could be more. Our advisory committee felt very strongly that we need to be clear that while TLP is a human intervention, it is emulating natural depositional processes in tidal marshes. So these are some great photos from Greg Moore in Massachusetts in 2018. Ice deposited a lot of sediment in marshes and it looked just like a TLP project, a bunch of sediment coming in all at once. So our marshes evolved with this. Uncontaminated dredged sediments are one potential source for TLP, um, and that can be very cost effective, but we also want to be clear that other sediment sources are available and sort of recent studies have shown that you really might want to focus on an external sediment source so you're not robbing Peter to pay Paul taking, taking sediment from an adjacent channel onto the marsh. Because TLP is still unfamiliar for many coastal managers, there's a real need for further large-scale, well-monitored experimental restoration projects in different geographic areas, plant communities, and salinity regimes. We wanted to be clear that TLP is just one tool in the toolbox that can be used singly or in combination, and it may not be the right tool for all approaches. Like in this figure, if you have a really gentle slope and no major development, maybe it's fine to lose the marsh in the current footprint and let new marsh migrate onto higher ground. We wanted to be clear that while any TLP must take necessary precautions to minimize adverse risks, you really need to weigh those risks against the potential long-term benefits. So here's an example from my site at Elkhorn Slough where we added sediment and initially you have bare ground, but our sea level rise modeling suggests that this will be the only marsh remaining after 50 centimeters of sea level rise, so that short-term Loss of vegetation may be outweighed by the long-term benefits. Um, and there may be a trade-off between optimizing long-term sustainability of a marsh and decreasing vegetative cover in the short term. If you add a thin layer, a bunch of the existing plants will survive. Um, if it's thicker, you'll end up with a bare area initially, but greater elevation capital in the long run. TLP projects should be assessed in a framework of thoughtful temporal planning, really considering whether you're going to do a one-time thick layer or multiple thin layers if you're in an area with lots of dredging where that's feasible. And likewise, TLP sites should be chosen in a thoughtful spatial framework. And for instance, thinking of a mosaic of bare and vegetated habitats allows you to have a seed source for the unvegetated areas and refuges for your marsh-dependent animals. Finally, strong networks of collaboration are critical for success of large-scale TLP projects. And we provide three different case studies that used a successful collaborative approach. 
The second component in our guidance package is a literature review of TLP. There really are still relatively few published studies, which we summarize in a table. And just sort of highlights of that table are that almost all past projects focused on Spartina. They found generally good recover for thinnish layers of sediment addition, but sulfate conditions are an issue in the more fine-grained sediments in particular. The third component of our document are permitting guidelines. We provide an overview of the logical sequence for navigating the permitting process for TLP and a table with the relevant permits needed. Of course, this varies by state and region, but it's sort of a broad overview. And it's pretty clear that in the future, we need policies that streamline the permitting processes for this sort of restoration work. The final component of our packet is monitoring guidelines. And we really highlighted the importance of setting quantitative measurable objectives for restoration success so that then you can monitor whether you have achieved it. And we suggest some universal metrics that are applicable anywhere so that then with consistent approaches applied, we could do meta-analyses and really compare across regions and sites. We identified the most critical metrics, of course, as being elevation and vegetation, which can either be assessed through field surveys or remote sensing. So that's a bit of an overview of TLP and the resources that we've created that we hope are useful to you on this webinar and to your colleagues. And now we're ready for the second component of today's webinar, the greenhouse experiments, and I'll turn it over to Beth Watson at Drexel University. Sure, you guys can hear me. Can yes. you hear me? Thank you, Kirstine. So I am speaking today on behalf of myself as well as um, PhD student Brittany Wilburn, who's here with me as well. Next slide, please. So the research questions that we were interested in addressing in our greenhouse study was first of all, how does sediment texture affect revegetation, especially for desired high marsh plants? So the context for this was that in the field experiments, um, essentially one sediment texture was applied to all different sorts of environmental conditions, tidal ranges, and plant types. In the greenhouse, we held the environmental conditions and the plant types constant so we could really better understand the effect of sediment texture. Secondly, we were interested in determining whether there are any benefits to incorporating biochar in these kinds of restoration projects. Can it encourage revegetation? Can it help reduce some of the acid sulfate conditions that have occurred by moderating the pH because biochar is very basic? And can it increase the amount of carbon sequestration in the project? Next slide, please. So to address the first question, we propagated um, three different kinds of plants in four different sediment textures. And these were benthic sediments collected from Bar Barnegat Bay during the spring and summer of 2008. We used bay water to simulate tides and mesocosms. And we used a factorial design that was replicated. So we had four different kinds of sediment textures, a medium silt, a fine sand, a medium sand, and a coarse sand. And you can see that these sediment types, in addition to differing in terms of their sand, silt, and clay content, they also differed, if you look at the histogram, in terms of the mode and um, the different sorting characteristics of the sediment texture. So these sediments, these sediment types probably vary in different ways besides sediment texture, but the sediment textures are also not very homogeneous. We use three different types of plants, Spartina alterniflora, the Atlantic ecosystem dominant, and then also Salicornia pacifica, which is a West Coast species, and Spartina patens, which is, grows on the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. And so these two last plants, the Salicornia and Spartina patens, are much less tolerant of tidal flooding than Spartina alterniflora. Next slide, please. So um, what we found was that for Spartina alterniflora, the sediment texture did not particularly matter in terms of the plant growth that we saw. So we saw um, growth that didn't really vary according to sediment texture too much. When you look at these plants that are intolerant of 
profound flooding, Salicornia and Spartina patens, we see that the above ground biomass production increases um, as the sediment gets coarser. Um, this is definitely true for Spartina patens. Um, it's somewhat true for Salicornia pacifica. Next slide, please. Uh, so our interpretations for this is that these flood intolerant plants, Salicornia pacifica and Spartina patens, um, do better in these coarser sediment textures because they are, um, these sediments are better drained and better oxygenated. Looking at the figure on the left, you can see that in the finer sediments, the medium silt and the fine sand, you saw um, anoxic conditions in the silts and sands versus in the medium sand and the coarse sand, you saw more oxygenated conditions. In the figure on the right, we see saturated hydraulic conductivity in the different sediments that we looked at. And basically what you see is that these finer sediments, the medium silt and the fine sand, had rates of you know, water moving through them that were orders of magnitude slower than we saw in the medium sand and the coarse sand. So these medium and coarse sands are much better drained. Next slide, please. Okay, so we were also interested in whether there were any benefits of incorporating biochar in these types of projects. So biochar is a carbonaceous material that is produced through anoxic combustion of organic matter. And it is pretty similar to charcoal. That's more or less the way that you can think about it. Uh, we were interested in incorporating biochar in projects because our partner reserve at Elkhorn Slough is using biochar in their large-scale restoration project they have ongoing right now. And we thought that it might contribute to carbon sequestration. Um, so to look at these specific questions that we're interested in, we propagated Spartina alterniflora under tidal conditions with and without biochar and compost amendments. We used a compost amendment because our supplier indicated that compost works together with biochar. Um, and we, the soil type that we used was a coarse low nutrient sand, thinking that if we wanted to see benefits of nutrient addition, we'd more likely see them in coarser sediments. We also propagated Salicornia pacifica under non-tidal conditions, attempting to simulate the development of acid sulfate. Um, conditions, so low salinity, uh, low pH. And so to do this, we used two types of soils that we had successfully produced acid sulfate conditions in before in incubation experiments, a sulfitic black sand and a mix of sulfitic pond mud and sand. Next slide, please. Um, so we found that biochar additions did not significantly enhance growth for uh, Spartina alterniflora, we didn't see any increases in above ground or below ground biomass with biochar, compost, or biochar and compost additions. And in addition, there's an indication that we might actually see slightly less below ground biomass with the biochar addition. Next slide, please. Um, we also, in our non-tidal experiment, we similarly found that biochar additions did not increase biomass or production of Salicornia pacifica. Um, however, if you look at this figure, you can see that um, if you compare the no biochar um, soils in green with the biochar amendments in orange, you can see that you see slightly more biomass um, in the with biochar conditions than you have in no biochar conditions. So even though we didn't see any significant difference, there's definitely a trend towards greater biomass for Salicornia pacifica. Um, press the button. <laughs> so another interesting thing about this particular experiment was that we were able to successfully produce acid sulfate conditions in one of our treatments, the pond mud plus sand treatment. And so in this experiment, we, or in this treatment, we saw pHs that were, poor water pHs that were on the order of three to five, so very low pHs. And yet, you can see that the salicornia grew pretty well under these conditions. And so to me, this suggests that salicornia is a plant that is fairly resistant to these low pH conditions. And it might be why it tends to um, be common in bare areas in tidal marshes. Next slide, please. 
Um, we uh, measured net ecosystem exchange of carbon dioxide with our plant and soil incubations. And we found that in the raw sand, um, we saw a tendency of the plant and soil mixture together to be taking up carbon dioxide, whereas with the biochar amendments, we saw that the plants and soil together were actually emitting carbon dioxide. So this suggests that the biochar amendments were decomposing in place, and so rather contributing to carbon sequestration, we saw they're contributing to carbon emissions, at least on this very short-term time frame. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned before, we were able to produce these very low pH conditions in our soil incubations. However, we found, as seen on the left, that the biochar additions did not help moderate the pH. So even though the pH of char is very, very basic on the order of 10 or 11, um, it didn't help uh, ameliorate the acid sulfate conditions. Um, we did find that the biochar contributed to changing the soil chemistry in a lot of different ways. The biochar amendments were uh, more oxygenated, um, were less saline, and had lower extractable ammonium. Final slide. So our take-home messages were, first of all, that coarse sediments were better drained and supported increased growth for high marsh plants. In terms of the biochar amendments, we found that they did not increase growth significantly. They actually increased carbon dioxide effluxes rather than contributing to carbon sequestration, and that they did not ameliorate acid sulfate conditions. With that, I'd like to turn it back over to Kirstine. Well, thank you so much for the greenhouse results. And now we're going to turn to the coordinated field experiment and Kenny Raposa. Can you hear me? Yep. Excellent. Thanks for joining today. So as Christine said, I'm going to start us off by introducing our TLP field experiment. And um, the main reason that we wanted to uh, do this project is because we felt there was a real need to uh, examine TLP across more diverse estuarine conditions. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, we did a literature, literature search and found that uh, the majority of post studies on TLP had been conducted in the Southeast, and in particular, the Gulf Coast of the US. Uh, focused primarily on uh, Spartina ultimate low marsh. Uh, we wanted to examine TLP in more regions, uh, looking at different plant communities and working in more than one elevation in a marsh, uh, not just in the low marsh. Next, please. We also felt um, that the NERS provided us with the perfect uh, platform for doing this kind of work. Uh, we currently have 29 reserves all around the country spanning uh, a wide diversity of estuarine geographies. And we also have uh, very consistent monitoring already in place across the system. Uh, and this uh, ensures that all the data that we collect is very highly comparable among um, all, the, all the participating sites. Next. We've also become um, pretty good, I think, in the last uh, few years or so at synthesizing um, our data uh, across broad spatial scales and across uh, many of our sites. And I've just listed three recent published examples here, uh, and I'll quick run through those. The first one you can see was a synthesis of marsh restoration success, which we looked at across eight reserves, and then followed that up with um, a synthesis of crab impacts to salt marshes around the country uh, at 15 reserves. And then in this third example, we uh, developed some brand new multi-metric indices of marsh resilience to sea level rise, and then we applied those indices to marshes at another 16 reserves. And so it's this third example at the bottom there that uh, I think really sets us up perfectly for doing our current TLP experiment. In the 16 reserve synthesis, we were uh, simply uh, assessing relative resilience to sea level rise, and now with our current experiment, we're moving past that uh, and into directly testing an adaptation technique that is designed specifically to build resilience. So we felt that these two projects went hand in hand. Next. And that does bring us to our, our ongoing coordinated uh, TLP experiment. This time we're working at uh, eight reserves. You can see them in this map with the participating sites uh, denoted with those blue markers. And so we have six sites on the East Coast stretching from New Hampshire down to North Carolina, and then two on the West Coast, uh, both out in Central California. Next. We're doing our experiment in small, about half square meter framed plots. 
And into these plots, we've added um, sediment that we've taken from local quarries. Uh, and then we standardized those quarry sediments by grain size to try to ensure that we'd be adding very similar sediments to these plots across all eight sites. And then in addition to that, we've also added in a, added in a 10 percent mixture of local marsh mud to these quarried sediments just to try to bring in some, some organic materials and to try to make them resemble a little bit more like real world dredge materials. Next. We're evaluating uh, three different factors in our experiment. So the first factor is elevation, uh, obviously comparing low marsh now to high marsh. The second factor is sediment thickness. So comparing a thin seven centimeter application versus a thicker 14 centimeter addition. And then the third factor is sediment type. So comparing our quarry mix to both quarry amended with biochar, uh, as well as to actual dredge. And so these first two factors we're examining across all eight reserves in the study, whereas only three reserves are comparing the quarry to the biochar, and then three different reserves are comparing the quarry to the um, dredge. Next. We're using, we're using a, um, a, a, a block design with five blocks um, located in each of the participating reserves. Within each of those blocks, uh, we have both a low marsh and a high marsh component. And then in each of those marsh components, we have a, a suite of different replicates. And I've gone ahead and listed these replicates here along with these little uh, sort of shorthand codes on the left hand side. And I want to quick run through those because you're going to see as we go through the results, um, these codes uh, are, sh are shown quite often. So real quick, the 7 and the 14 are obviously the codes for the thin and the thick sediment additions. B or D, also obvious, biochar or dredge additions. C are unframed control plots. Zero are framed control plots. So those are frames without any sediment added. And then REF are reference plots, which, which I'll explain in just a minute. On the right-hand side, you can see how this looks in, uh, in the field. This is a map of Elkhorn Slough, California. And you can see one single block uh, there at the top of the map with the, um, the low plots clustered together down along the edge of the tidal creek and then the high plots aligned uh, along the uh, upland uh, marsh ecotone on the left. Next. Uh, we set our plots out in very targeted uh, places in our marshes because we wanted to focus on restoration goals that are uh, specific to TLP. We're basically looking for areas in all these marshes where um, they had recently experienced change due to sea level rise because we wanted to see if TLP could then help reverse some of those changes. So in the low marsh, we put our plots in, um, in bare areas because we wanted to see if uh, TLP could increase overall cover of any vegetation species uh, to these areas that are currently bare. In the high marsh, we were looking for areas where uh, low marsh species had recently encroached and replaced high marsh species because we wanted to see if TLP could then help increase the cover of those rarer uh, high marsh plants. And then finally, there at the bottom, you can see the reference plots I mentioned. We put these um, about 10 centimeters higher than all the other plots uh, in both of those marsh zones. And we put them in areas with uh, intact vegetation that was representative of healthy marsh. Uh, in essence, these reference plots were what uh, we wanted our TLP plots to come to look like over time uh, after adding the sediment. OK, next. For monitoring, uh, we added the sediment in spring 2018, but we started monitoring earlier in fall 2017 just to set a baseline. And then we monitored throughout the project with our most recent uh, monitoring event in summer or fall 2019, and then one additional event uh, scheduled for later this year. And we monitored a suite of key uh, parameters, including, of course, uh, plot elevation over time, as well as sediment and poor water chemistry conditions of our plots. Um, you're going to see in the results that the main focus of our paper was examining uh, vegetation responses, so looking at things like veg uh, composition, cover, and canopy heights. And then in conjunction with vegetation monitoring, we also quantified crab burrow densities and also took pictures of the plots every time we sampled them, just because we wanted to um, create this visual timeline of change across the plate. Okay, 
And here, finally, are some of our, uh, the results from our field project. This is me looking at one of our more successful plots in Narragansett Bay, and I'm very happy. And as you're going to see, I think we have some, some really interesting and encouraging results. But before I, I mention those, I want to just uh, mention two quick caveats. Today, we're only showing data from seven of the eight reserves because San Francisco Bay ran into some uh, extreme permitting delays, and so they started about a year later. So no data from them today. And then we're also only showing data from the high marsh for Chesapeake Bay, Maryland, uh, because their low plots were lost due to some pretty extreme wave energy events down near the, uh, the water's edge. So with that, the first thing we'll look at are changes to plot elevation over time. And I want to walk you through this one single example shown here from Elkhorn Slough uh, before showing you data from all the reserves at once because that gets uh, very busy. So in this example, you can see the y-axis is, is simply plot elevation, whereas the x-axis are the different monitoring timestamps moving from uh, fall 2017 pre-sediment on the left to fall 2019 on the right. Uh, bottom right, you can see we have data from three different treatments, uh, the 7, seven, the seven centimeter edition, the 14 centimeter, and then in Elkhorn's case, the biochar edition. Uh, we have data at the top of the plot for the high marsh, and then data at the bottom for the low marsh. And then finally, you can see these horizontal dashed reference lines in each marsh zone. Uh, those, are the, those are basically the target elevation increases we were shooting for uh, with the sediment addition. So in each case, that, that higher reference line is the 14 centimeter target, and the lower one is the 7 centimeter uh, target increase. Uh, next, Christine. And with uh, what we see at Elkhorn uh, in this example is that they were really successful at achieving their target elevation increases. In the low marsh, they nailed it exactly. And in the high marsh, they actually even overshot, overshot their target just a little bit. And then what you can also see is that these plot elevations then began to decline uh, steadily but gradually over the next about 15 to 18 months. Um, but by the end of... Um, about fall 2019, you can see the elevations were still uh, much higher than initial and still right around the targets we were shooting for. So they did an excellent job there. Next. And then when you look at the data from all the sites combined, you can see, uh, looking uh, at all these sites at once, you can see that the same pattern was found with every single site hitting those target elevations uh, with that initial sediment application. And then you can also see that all these sites then did also experience uh, declines in their plot elevation over the next 18 months or so. For the most part, these de declines were also uh, generally uh, gradual and slow, although in a few cases, for example, Great Bay, New Hampshire in the top left, and even my reserve in Narragansett, Rhode Island in the low marsh, some of these declines were, were a little bit more rapid than we expected. Next. Next, we want to look at some uh, simple structural uh, characteristics of our sediments that we added to our TLP plots and compare those to ambient natural uh, marsh peat as well as sediments added to large-scale real-world TLP projects uh, nearby to the reserves. So we did this with an ordination technique and primer. And if you look at the legend on the top right, you can see that the reserve sent in samples from both ambient high and low marsh areas as well as samples from the um, experimental plots in our project, so the quarry mud mix and the dredge as the green squares, and then also quarry and dredge uh, from local real-world TLP projects, shown as the yellow circles. Uh, next, Kirstein. And with this ordination, you can see uh, the take-home message is that these TLP plots in our experiment, they did have significantly different sediment characteristics than did the ambient. But at the same time, you can see that our, uh, the sediments in our plots as the green squares, they intermix very nicely with sediments used in real world TLP projects. You can see all these TLP samples, regardless of source, uh, grouping together very nicely in the lower left and away from ambient uh, that are over towards the right. And then down at the bottom, you can see a primary reason for, the, for this is that our TLP sediments were very sandy. So you can see the ambient marsh uh, Soils were about 30% sand, whereas the sediments used in our plots were about double that, about 60 to 65% sand. Uh, next. And then last slide for me today, this is just another uh, example ordination, this time uh, looking at a different suite of sediment uh, 
um, parameters combined with some, uh, some basic pore water chemistry parameters. And this time, we're just looking at some variability among some of the different treatments within our single experiment. And so again, top right in the legend, you can see we have samples from two sediment addition treatments. Um, yeah, the, the gray square, there we go. Uh, so the seven and the 14 as the, the triangles, and then two ambient marsh treatments, the unframed controls in the green squares, and then the reference plots as the pink diamonds. Uh, next, Christine. So with this ordination, we had a couple of take home messages. Uh, again, we found that the TLP plots had significantly different uh, sediment in pore water uh, conditions than did the ambient. And at the same time, we found that the sediment addition effect in our experiment far outweighed any potential regional, di regional differences among all these diverse uh, reserves. You can see all these TLP plots uh, grouping together nicely here at the left and once again away from ambient. And next, in this case, the reason for this is that these TLP sediments in our experiment, and this was very consistent among every single site, the TLP sediments had much higher uh, bulk density, redox, and pH, and lower um, ammonium and water content than did the ambient marsh soil. Bottom line, every way we looked at it, uh, the TLP sediments were very different from the ambient marsh peat soil. And next, and that is it from me. I'm going to turn it back over to Kirstine. She's going to show you some of our even more interesting vegetation results and then take us home with some, some, some concluding remarks. Excellent. Thank you. You can hear me? Yep. Excellent. So on to vegetation. This photo collage just gives you a sense of what our plots looks like here in the high marsh. They started out vegetated, though with the dominant low marsh species that we didn't really want there. Then we added the sediments, they were bare, and then they pretty rapidly colonized. To look at that in the same sort of format as Kenny showed you for elevation, we'll look at the total vegetation cover on the y-axis in the same time series. So right when we added sediment, the vegetation cover is zero. And you can see from this example from North Carolina that there's pretty rapid recovery already a few months after we added sediment addition and that that's higher in the seven than in the 14 sediment addition. If we look at that across all of the reserves, you can see that generally um, revegetation rate was quite high, though it was variable across the reserves. If we look at that for the high marsh, um, similar patterns, again, rapid revegetation rate, but variable across the reserves. And in general, one pattern to note is that the 7 centimeter generally colonized faster than the 14 centimeter, which suggests it's existing vegetation, not seedlings that are at least initially appearing. But by the end of our uh, 15 months or so monitoring period, they were starting to converge at most sites. So beyond just the trajectory, I want to remind you again, as Kenny told you, of our goals for the low marsh we were really trying to address this problem that we've seen at a lot of reserves of pans opening up in the low marsh of lack of vegetation in formerly vegetated areas. Um, and so if you look at our reference plots, um, these are the ones that are 10 centimeters higher. So I'm introducing you to a graph you're going to see again and again. So look at this one now and the others will make sense, our close up view here. This is percent cover by vegetation in the low marsh, and we're shooting for sort of a higher level. Um, and then we have all the treatment plots before we did anything, the control plots after, our unframed control, and then on the far right are our sediment addition treatments. And so what you really want to do is think about this red and blue, which is a 7 and 14, and compare them to the reference plot, what we're shooting for, or even just compare them to the control and see how they're doing. And in this case, you can see for North Carolina, in the low marsh, the reference is still doing a lot better than the sediment addition. Maybe the seven's doing a little bit better than the control. So if we look at that across all the reserves, um, again, start by focusing on that far left reference plot bar. And you can see we didn't really achieve that reference level of vegetation anywhere. 
at least after 15 months, we'll, we'll keep monitoring. If you look at the control bar, you can see that in just a few cases we exceeded it, but for the most part, uh, the sediment addition plots did not actually do better than the control. Um, in terms of site differences, uh, the most striking one here is that Elkhorn looked terrible. Our TLP plots um, are pretty bare still 15 months in. And then one thing we weren't expecting but discovered was that there were interannual differences. If you compare the before to the after, you see this really strong effect, stronger actually than our treatment effect at four sites, and it actually holds at every single site. Um, we had more vegetation in the controls after than before. And so that's actually intriguing since we're on different coasts and different regions. We're guessing this might be the metonic tidal cycles and, and less tidal inundation in the, the more recent times. But cool, unexpected finding. Um, in terms of sediment thickness, comparing the red and the blue bar, the 7 and the 14 centimeters, we really only saw a pronounced difference at two sites where the seven did better, meaning existing vegetation um, was doing the colonizing. In terms of sediment type at Narragansett, they were looking at biochar and it did better, oops, better than the um, 14. At Chesapeake, Virginia, they were looking at dredge and it did worse than the 14. At the other sites that tested different sediment types, we didn't see a significant difference. Now I'd like to shift gears to the high marsh. Our goals here are different. We're not really just trying to increase cover. We're wondering whether TLP might be a mechanism to increase relative cover of the rarer high marsh species that have been crowded out in recent years. So this is Kenny standing in Narragansett Bay amongst our alterna flora, Spartina alterna flora, right up next to the upland in a place that used to have patents. And so he's trying to convert it back to patents with sediment addition. And for us in California, it would be Disticlis or Frankenia we're aiming for rather than Salicornia. So again, this type of a plot, in this case, what's on the y-axis is covered just of the high marsh species, not the excluding that low marsh dominant. And just like in the low marsh, you can see we didn't really do a good job of hitting our goals of reaching the cover in those reference plots that were 10 centimeters higher than our treatment area. In terms of the comparison to the controls, we also, for the most part, did not um, surpass the, the control levels, though, though we did in a few places like Chesapeake, uh, Virginia, and Elkhorn. In terms of sediment thickness, comparing the red and the blue bars, um, we actually only had a significant effect at, at Elkhorn, where the seven was, had much more cover of high marsh species than the 14. In terms of the sediment type comparisons, Chesapeake, Virginia had that dredge sediment, and it did worse than the 14 without dredge with the quarry sediment. At Elkhorn, we were testing biochar, and biochar did better than the 14. The other sites testing different sediments had no significant effects. One unanticipated finding was that in our sediment addition plots, especially at low elevation, we saw a pretty dramatic increase in crab burrows. So crabs like TLP, and this doesn't seem to be just an artifact of our little experimental plots. We've seen it at real world TLP projects in both Rhode Island and California too. So I want to summarize the, the take-home message of our coordinated experiments. As Kenny showed you, our sediment addition did increase the elevation and sandiness of these plots and affected pore water. Plant revegetation was typically quite rapid, already starting within a few months. However, the reference level of desired plant cover was not achieved anywhere, and even the control level was not surpassed in most places after 15 months. We'll see how it is with one more year of monitoring. And this sort of surprising result that interannual differences in the controls were as strong as some of the treatment effects. So that's why you need something like a backy design where you're looking before and after in your control and treatment plots. 
In terms of comparing the 7 versus 14 centimeters uh, sediment addition, we found the 7 recovered faster in general, but at the end of 15 months, they were converging. So given that, our recommendation would be go, go for the thicker layer, um, gain that elevation capital. Comparing the high marsh and the low marsh, we found faster recovery of vegetation at high elevation, but a lot of that recovery was by the dominant low marsh species, and we were hoping to get the rarer high marsh species. So it, sort of conversely, our goals were actually better achieved at low elevation. We also found more crab burrows in the low sediment addition plots. In terms of sediment type differences, we found dredged sediment was worse for plant cover than quarry sediment at one site, but there was no effect at a second site, and we're still awaiting the results from San Francisco, which is the third site. Um, so sediment type definitely can matter, and the potential for biochar amendment could be further explored, as with Beth's results, um, there's sort of a suggestive role, because one out of three of the sites that use biochar amendment saw improvements in the plant recovery. Probably our most striking finding is the differences we saw across sites. So here Narragansett in the low marsh after 15 months, nicely vegetated. Elkhorn slough in the low marsh, there's a few little tufts, but it's mostly bare. So the effects of TLP vary across sites in strength and direction of effect, and you really can't generalize from one place to another. So you can't read a paper about one area and assume that's going to be true of your area. And the NERP platform really was excellent for these sorts of consistent comparisons among sites. So we've covered a lot of ground in the last 40 minutes. And I want to give you the single most important take-home message for each of the three components we've covered. So for the first component, we just wanted you to know that there is this packet available for you and your partners to use that has the consensus statement, literature review, monitoring, and permitting guidelines. So check it out. Pass it on to people who could use it. For the second component, the greenhouse experiments, the most important thing to remember from that is that sediment texture can really matter in TLP. And for the third component, the coordinated experiments, the most important take home is that marsh response differs by geographic region and by marsh elevation. And that concludes our webinar for today, and we can open the floor to questions. Thank you, Kirstine. All right, so um, uh, there are a few questions in here, and if anybody has any questions that they would like me to ask of the presenters, please um, put them in the chat box. So the first question we have is for Elizabeth, and that was, what was your sample size and how many replicates are we talking about? Which component is that referring to? That's for Elizabeth, for the greenhouse. Got it. She might need to be up. Elizabeth and Kenny, can you unmute your um, yourselves? Or Eric, do you need to unmute them? Uh, am I unmuted now? Yes. Yes. Um, the, we had we kind of ran three different experiments, so there were a different number of replicates per treatment, but it was four to eight in general. All right, and and for Kirstein, um, what was what has your observations been with invasives after the completion of a TLP project? Um, that's a great question. And Kenny's probably more familiar with the data. I don't think we saw a lot at Elkhorn Slough. We had an atriplex species that's non-native in some of the high marsh plots. But it was um, across all our plots, I'd say, a fairly minor component. Kenny, you have more on that? No, you, that's exactly right. I, um, I can't recall any significant invasives coming into any of our plots. Hmm. All right, and the, the next question is for all of you, um, what is the sea level rise predictions for the areas for this, in which this study occurred um, in terms of like for 2050 or 2100? Were they low, medium, high predictions? 
uh, the the um, participant who asked this felt that that might help people on the call uh, give some perspective. Uh, I'm going to chime in first. Um, so uh, even though we didn't have an experiment necessarily in the Mid-Atlantic, um, except for you know Chesapeake Bay, uh, we've had about half a meter of sea level rise about over the last 100 years. Our prediction for the next 100 years are anywhere between about that, about half a meter of sea level rise, all the way up to two meters of sea level rise. Um, over the past uh, 20 to 40 years, we've seen rates of rise in mean high water that are on the order of a centimeter per year. So if you're talking about a 14 centimeter addition or a 7 centimeter addition, um, that, you know, is basically buying you on the order of, um, you know, 10 to, to say 40 um, years in this area. All right, and if there's any other questions um, by anyone on the phone, please um, put them in the chat box. I actually have one question that I wrote down um, while you were talking to Kirsten. You actually came to the punchline at the end about Elkhorn. It was striking to me that the TLP um, edition um, did not really uh, benefit in the low marsh for Salicornia. So do you, I mean, it was striking. Do you um, have any conclusions about um, TLP in the low marsh, is it just with salicornia? Um, do you think that as sea level rises that that low marsh will, um, will move landward? What kind of implications is there for that? I don't know that um, we understand the mechanism. So to our surprise, our control plot in the low marsh um, actually gained vegetation during the study. We'd placed them, we'd placed all the treatment plots in pans that were at least 50% bare, and a lot of those control ones actually filled in while the TLP ones remained bare. I'm thinking that we entirely killed the little existing vegetation there was by the addition of the sediment, and that um, successful arrival, retention, and germination of seeds occurs at a low rate in our low marsh, and maybe the surface was too smooth for the seeds to stick or they, the conditions mm. were inappropriate. The reason the, the control ones filled in was not from seedling colonization, but from sort of encroaching plants recovering through vegetative growth. But yeah, I mean, that would be a nice student follow-up to look at our bear plots and try, you know, planting seeds into them to see do they die, you know, is there something wrong with the conditions or is it recruitment limitation and we don't know at this point. Cool. Okay. Um, and have you considered analyzing vegetation responses relative to mean sea level versus elevation yeah. and comparing responses by tidal range? Or might that be another uh, science collaborative project? <laughs> That's a great suggestion to include that. We do have that information for the reserves. I think the sample size of eight may be a little bit too low that we can't, you know, compare microtidal to macrotidal or compare um, different elevation communities. In you can't do much of a regression with eight points, but we can definitely look at that and and see Elkhorn is one of the lower um, marsh communities in terms of its tolerance level. We know that from the Mars paper that Kenny told you about. And so maybe if you're right at the bottom edge, it's just hard to save you. And I, I can just so people know, we are, um, and we presented um, a lot of interesting results today, I think, but we're still in the middle of um, figuring out all the exact analyses we're going to do. And so this is still kind of a work in progress. And again, we're going to be collecting another round of data this year, and hopefully we'll have some of these cool, cool analyses done and more analyses done um, in a published paper within the next year or so. With a little progress. All right. Well, I see no more questions, and we're coming up on 3 o'clock. So I want to close by um, saying that on behalf of Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA, I wanted to just say thanks to Kirstine, Elizabeth, and Kenny for taking time out of their busy schedules to provide this really fascinating presentation on building marsh capital, adding sediment to help marshes face rising sea levels. Remember, for those of you on the call, 
I mean on the on the webinar, that you'll receive an email after this webinar with a link to a short evaluation form. Please take a moment to send us your comments and suggestions for improvement. And the email will also include a link to the Restoration Webinar Series archive. And feel free to forward the archive link to anyone that might be interested in this presentation but was unable to attend. We expect that the link to this presentation will be added to the archive probably in about two or three weeks. And also don't forget that if you want SER learning credits for attending the workshop, contact Lynn Jendel at SER. And I'm not sure, Eric, if you, um, if you put the uh, Jen's email in the chat box if you could, but I'll also include it in the email with the evaluation. So thanks again to everyone for attending today's webinar. We'll see you next time for the latest installment of the Restoration Webinar Series for 2020. It will be on March 5th, and it's going to be Stage Zero Restoration, what it is and why it's important. It will be by Brian Kluwer from NOAA and Paul Powers from U.S. Forest Service. So from all of us to all of you, have a great day.